began a few weeks ago. We're going to be going through 1 Corinthians. And so now today we find ourselves in chapter 3, chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. And we've entitled the sermon series Realignment, in essence what the Apostle Paul is doing with the Corinthians and through the span of time, even to us, he is teaching us, he's telling us, hey, these are some things that we have to realign. We have to reorientate ourselves to refocus upon the cross. Because it's, I talked about already in this sermon series, it's easy to get distracted in the world in which we live. And I think this morning as we talk about the text a little bit more so, we're going to see that in the context of the Corinthians and in the context of our own day and age, it's very easy to be distracted. One of the things about ancient Corinth that you need to understand, to really understand the book itself, is just how much the temple worship and the various gods and goddesses influenced and in essence infected every aspect of ancient Greek life. Now you understand that, that if you were to walk down the street just out of your house and walk down to the marketplace, almost everywhere that you would have looked, along the viewpoint that you would have had, you would have seen various temples, various statues that were prayed to, that were worshipped. This was a part of the daily life. To pretend that the pantheon of gods and goddesses were not worshipped in ancient Corinth would be like you pretending that the internet doesn't exist. It's ridiculous. And the reality is, is and as much as maybe you don't like to think about it or, or consider how much the influence, how much influence the internet has on your life, this pantheon of gods and goddesses and, and their various worship and the way that they were worshipped in their temples, they impacted and they influenced the Corinthians greatly. Even those that were Christian, that were trying to worship the one God and honor the glorified Jesus Christ. You see, throughout time, people have been building temples. There's nothing new. You don't have to go to ancient Corinth and find that that's the anomaly. If you go further back in time, you can find that there have been great structures that have been erected in the name of various gods and goddesses. And in most of these temples and various places of worship that are very ornate, very beautiful, have been done by numerous religions. Not just a singular one. There have been many religions that have erected these structures. You can find the remnants and even them currently being built all across the globe. It doesn't matter what culture, it doesn't matter what ethnic group they come from, this is something that is innate within the human spirit. Now what I find is fascinating about this is that I believe that there is something being communicated to us even through the various temples being erected to false gods and goddesses because I believe that this communicates something to us about the true God. What is one thing about the God of heaven, the God of earth, the God of all things, that might be the, the most pivotal thing that he ever did? Now, now I know that we can pin, we can, we can look through the pages of the Old Testament and we can search and we can find all kinds of marvelous, miraculous things. But what would all of this be without Genesis 1? God created. God is the creator. He, he is the creator God. He loves to create things. He loves to build things, if you will. And we who are his children, who are created in his image and his likeness, is it not logical that, that we equally, like God, like to create things? You don't find animals going out and, and building anything of any substance. Birds are not creative with the way that they build their nests, not necessarily. Other animals are, do not necessarily erect structures, not the way that we do. It is the human species, and the human species alone, that builds. And I believe that we create because we are created in the image 
of the great creator. Paul plays on this idea in this text that we are going to study. But you see, it is not just a temple that Paul is speaking of. You see, Paul is pointing to the greatest temple that has ever been built, that cannot be duplicated by modern science or technology, for it is the very blueprint of humanity. Human beings are the greatest temple, for the temple of the human was created by God to house, from our understanding of the New Testament, the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit, which indwells and fills us whenever we give our lives fully over to Christ Jesus. Paul utilizes this thought process as he communicates to these Corinthians who are walking about the streets and they see various temples erected to, to the various gods and goddesses of the Romans and of the Greeks. And he says, but you are the great temple. And your temple was designed to house the true and the only God in his spirit. See, God's will for us is that we prepare ourselves according to his plan to be a holy temple for which his Holy Spirit might dwell. So as we begin this morning, let me ask you a couple of key questions. What kind of a temple are you? And how are you building your temple? What kind of a temple am I? And how am I erecting? How am I building this temple? See, these questions are key to what Paul is communicating to us. And I believe that this is the exact question that's posed to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. If you would please stand as I read the text. <laughs> By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone built on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. You may be seated. This is a key passage in all of 1 Corinthians that we just have read. Now, I believe that, that as we read this, that this is an eschatology. Let me explain what I mean by eschatology. Eschatology is the study of end times, end things. It's where we get this, this theological word, eschatology. And so it is, I believe that Paul is giving to us an eschatological a message. He's telling something about the end times, about something that will happen. Now, this isn't something that you're going to find necessarily in a, in a book right on the shelf that you can purchase and buy, but this is something that's innate to a certain kind of judgment that will occur. You see, Paul is saying to us that there is a day in which the temple of God, that meaning you being the temple, will be judged. But now I believe that he's speaking very specifically to Christians. Now there are two forms of judgment that are typically accepted within the realm and the world of those who study end times. And there's one that is called the Bema Seat of Christ, and there is the Great White Throne of Judgment. Now whenever I was a kid, and maybe it's because someone gave me a track, for some reason in my mind, I envisioned that I would stand before God himself and there would be a movie screen of my life, a play-by-play, -play, if you will. And on this movie screen, all of the infractions of the law, every sin that I have committed, all those things would be 
portrayed and played up there. And ultimately, it would be found that I was guilty of violating God's law. But then as I got a little bit older, and, and I began to think about this, and I, and I especially started to study these things whenever I was in Bible college and now in seminary, I started to think, but is that really necessary? Is there any necessity for, for God to show me all the ways that I've sinned? Because I'm a Christian. And as a Christian, one of the very primary foundations of my belief is that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Because I, I have violated the law. And so is there any necessity for God to show me that I've sinned? I've already confessed freely that I've sinned. I've begged for his repentance, his mercy, and his grace, which was freely given to me upon the cross. And that it is in faith that I've accepted that Jesus has justified me from all of the things that I have done and I will do. So I started to think, well, then there's no necessity for, for me to stand before this great white throne of judgment. Because if I stand before that great white throne of judgment, all that's going to be found out is that I'm guilty of violating the law, which I've already confessed that I've broken. But rather that there is another school of thought that says, but there is another judgment that Christians face. Do not stand in the great white throne of judgment, for that judgment is whether or not you kept the law perfectly or not. Now, non-Christians and those who refuse to accept Jesus will stand in that place. But the rest of us who are all ourselves Christians, who have confessed that we are sinners in need of a Savior, we go before the elevated seat of Christ, or the Bema seat of Christ. Now, what is that judgment there? Well, that judgment is Christ asked us, what have you done? What have you done with the salvation that I have given to you? How have you invested what it is that I have given to you into the world in which I placed you? Now, there are some of us, as this text says, that are building with valuable and precious material, gold, <coughs> silver, precious stones. But there are others who build with straw, hay, and sticks. Now, I don't mean to, to, be, to be too crass here, but do you all remember the story of the three little piggies? <laughs> right? We remember the story of the three little pigs. I have to believe that that the, that the author of, of that little tale must have been inspired by this text. And we remember what happened to those three little pigs, right? The first little pig, he was in a hurry, so he ran off and he made his house of straw. Another one made his house of sticks. And what did that last little pig do? He made his house of brick and mortar, right? And as the big bad wolf came and approached each one of those houses, <coughs> It would come to find out that the last pig who, who built his house with brick and mortar, his house was the house that stood the test. You see, my friends, I believe that Paul is, is painting a picture not unlike the story of the three little pigs. But there are some of us who are Christians who are building with valuable and precious materials, brick and mortar. But there are others that are cutting corners that are doing nothing more than just trying to just get by. And they do nothing except build with sticks and straw. Whenever that structure is tested, and Paul is saying that a day is coming in which testing will come, how will your structure stand that test? How will your structure stand that inspection? You see, it's really about considering more than just the here and the now. It is so easy for us to be distracted with the present tense. We are a people that are fixated and fascinated in the present tense. And although we might consider and we might rationally know that there is a future, very rarely do we like to consider it or think about it or plan for it. And sadly, there are so many in this world in which we live that they give no thought 
to that fact that they'll die and what lies beyond. So many have come to embrace this idea that if I'm a good person, then, then clearly I will go to heaven. How many funerals have I done for people who had no affiliation with the church whatsoever and the family comforts themselves with this thought that Grandpa Bob is looking down on them from heaven, smiling and having a big party, lots of beer and gambling going on up there. I've literally heard that before. I'm not joking. People, people fixate themselves on this idea and somehow that, that gives them some kind of peace. I like the way that Leon Steer says it in his book of devotions. I've had conversations with people who have declared a firm belief in the life to come without that belief being connected to Jesus in any way. It is easy to point out that such a belief, if unconnected to Jesus, is not connected to anything at all. Where else can you point to a foundation for such an outrageous belief that the dead will live again, other than the one who died and rose from the dead, Jesus Christ. And yet, there are all kinds of people who, like the foolish builder, will live day to day, any one of which could be their last, without giving the least bit of thought about what comes next. And so I share this devotional thought with you. Are you considering what comes next? And although you have laid your foundation upon Christ, and although you have come to trust Him and you have surrendered your life to Him, those of you who are Christians in this room, then how are you building? And with what are you building? Are you building with things that cost much? Or are you barely getting by with <coughs> sticks and straw? You see, we must be mindful of the foundation of our temple. Now ask any contractor, and I know there are a few in the room, ask any contractor, and they will tell you that a building is only as good as its foundation, right? If the foundation is faulty, the building is doomed. If the foundation is solid, the building will last, and it can stand a very long time. You see, this is a parallel that Paul is playing with here. And he's saying, you see all these temples all around you, here in Corinth. I might even say, you see all these temples here in Kansas City, all around you. Oh, granted, they take a different form, they take a different structure, but they're temples nonetheless. Temples of entertainment, temples of financial prosperity. Oh, there are many temples. Temples of education. You see them just as much as I do. Just as much as the ancient Corinthians saw their temples dedicated to Mars and dedicated to Athena and all the other various gods and goddesses. But the question that Paul is saying is that there's a singular foundation for which a structure can truly last. The temple of the living body, the living soul, will truly last. And that is the foundation of Christ Jesus and Jesus alone. You see, Paul is asking us to inspect and look at our foundation. And remember that upon which you have dedicated yourself. That from which you have said, I will build upon from this day forward. Remember the foundation for which you have begun your journey. I'm also reminded not only of ancient Corinth, but I'm equally reminded of that ancient tabernacle, that holy tent, if you will, <coughs> that was carried around in the desert as the Israelites had escaped captivity of the Egyptians, and now they wandered in Sinai, in the peninsula there, near Egypt. And Moses went upon this mountain, 
And not only did he receive the Ten Commandments on that mountain, but also Moses received instruction on how to build the place of worship and which the Israelites would carry with them from place to place. Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9, the Lord speaking, saying, Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all of its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Now there's something very pivotal that's spoken here. And I'm asking you to remember back a little bit. Remember back into that Old Testament. You see, because the Old Testament paints the picture perfectly for the New Testament. And whenever, remember last uh, year, whenever we were reading through the book of Hebrews, what did Hebrews say? The author of Hebrews told us that the temple, the tabernacle, all its furnishings, all of that was but a shadow. Remember that? It's but a shadow. What is that shadow casting and pointing us in direction to? To Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And so this place of worship in which these ancient Israelites are commanded to build exactly the way in which God had commanded them to do, that is pointing to Christ. You see, because it is exactly upon Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone that our worship, that our temple might be built upon. You see, this is not the plan of Moses. Moses did not go up on top of the mountain saying, hey God, I've got a few ideas here. I'd like to get you just to check them off and put your rubber stamp on them. No, that was not what Moses did as he ascended that mountain. But rather, this was God's plan. God was not apathetic or indifferent to how it is and where it is that he would be worshipped, and, and the place upon which he would be <clears throat> dwelling here on this earth. No, the specifications of this structure came from him, and him alone. God had a plan, and he expected the Israelites to carry this plan out exactly to the specifications of which he had given to them. But sadly, my friends, we know that there are many that want to build their temple on the foundation of their choosing. However, Paul tells us there is but one foundation. There are people who look at the fundamental principles of Christianity and they say, well, I really like love your neighbor as yourself. That's a, that's a good thing. That, that golden rule. We should, we should keep that. But worship the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, body, your soul. I don't like that. I want to I subtract that from that part of that foundation. I don't like that part about whichever one of you wants to live will die, and whoever wants to die for me will live. Now, we'll take that out of that foundation. We don't like that part either. Pull that out of there. Now, there's some good things that I like, but I want to keep those, but I, I don't like those other parts that might interfere with my lifestyle and the way that I want to live. I don't like repentance. I don't like forgiveness. I don't like discipline. Now, friends, let me ask you the, an elementary question. If I was to go to your house and I was to start to knock out parts of your foundation if I had the ability to do that, would you be okay with that? Oh, yeah, you can just take that part out there, Victor. That's okay. Of course not. You'd be like, but did you lose your mind? Are you crazy coming over here with a sledgehammer hitting on my house? No way, man. Get out of here. Because you know that if, if I take a part of your foundation out, what's going to happen? Well, then the rest of the structure is compromised, is it not? There is a singular foundation for which we must build our temple, my friends. And that is in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus alone. That means that we must accept wholly the foundation for which he has laid for us. We cannot subtract or supplement anything that is in that foundation. But we must accept it as it is. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, 
which is Jesus Christ. You see, my friends, it is clear. And it is simple. Humanity has a singular blueprint for which our salvation has been given to us. Let us be diligent to build upon Christ. But then there's another part here that we must consider. That we must be mindful of the future of our temple. Let me again read verses 12 and 13. If anyone built on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If you go on reading, in the King James Version, it says that there will be those that will be saved, but they will smell of smoke. In the NIV Version, it says that they have passed through a wall of flame. But it communicates this idea, you made it. But boy, you barely made it. You made it by the skin of your teeth. Those are the ones that have chosen to not be mindful of the future. Those that have decided to cut the corners as much as they possibly can. To build without any quality and to just build quickly. You see, the question that is being asked is, is how are you going to build? Are you going to build steadfastly, line upon line, precept upon precept, building a spiritual house that cannot be swept away with mere materials that will endure? How will you build? Now let me pause for a moment and let me say something. And the way that this text has been interpreted by some, I believe, is, is a misinterpretation of the text. What Paul is not saying to us is, your works will save you. That is not what the Apostle Paul is saying. The Apostle Paul is not saying that unless your works look like this, you are damned to hell. That is not what the Apostle Paul is saying. The Apostle Paul is not saying God will only love you if your works look like this. That is not what the Apostle Paul is saying. So please do not try to apply that interpretation to this text. Because that is not what is being communicated. God loves you. God loves you regardless of how your temple looks. Whether or not your temple is built with gold and silver, or your temple is built with sticks and straw, God loves you. God is not saying to you, you have to earn my love. That is not what God is saying to us in this text. But what is being communicated to us is be mindful of how you build. It will be tested, but be mindful with how you build. You see, after you became a Christian, ultimately you accepted the blueprints of God in your conversion. And in that moment, and at that time, you began to build a spiritual house. Now some of you have been building for a long time. And others of you have just begun the building process. But let me tell you this. This is the great news. The great news is, is that as long as you have life in your veins, as long as you have breath in your lungs, you can continue to remodel. Right? Those of you who own a house, remodeling is just part of the job, right? Those of you who have wives, you hear it all the time about how remodeling is part of the job. Right? Remodeling is something that God has given to us as a gift. So you can always go back where that area that you patched with sticks and hay can be replaced later on. You see, the question that I want you to consider this morning is, how am I building? 
How am I building my life right now? I'm not saying, I want you to ask the question, how can I earn God's love? But I want you to ask the question, how am I building? And how does my building reflect the love that God has given to me? What kind of a life am I building? Am I building with integrity? Am I building with honesty? Am I building with humility? For this is gold, silver, precious stone. Am I cutting corners? Am I hiding things? Am I addicted to things? And these drive my spirituality more than the love of God. For this is wood, hay, and straw. This is the question that this text forces us to answer. There are some that have misplaced ideas. And they think about this all wrong. And they think that oh, if only they could just put these checks in the box and that will, will get me by from the eye of God. There was a man just finished the service. He met the pastor in the lobby. He had a complaint to file. The pastors love that. <laughs> He had a complaint to file with that pastor in the lobby. He said, Pastor, I want to tell you something. Every time I come to this church, we always sing the same song. I think you guys should mix it up a little bit, because I'm tired of coming to this church and only singing Old Little Town of Bethlehem and Silent Night. That's the only songs we ever sing whenever I come to this church. <laughs> now, the pastor, he, he thought about that for a moment. I think you already know the punchline. <laughs> Pastor thought about that for a moment. He said, well, the only time you come to church, sir, is on Christmas. This is, this is the song that we sing at Christmas. You see, there are some that think that just coming to church on Christmas, maybe in a few months we'll see the pews get a little bit fuller here because it's Easter. But that's going to get them by. My question to them is the same question I'm asking you here today. How are you building? How are you building that temple? What does that look like? That you only want to be with brothers and sisters in Christ because it's a holiday? Or you want to be with brothers and sisters in Christ because you love their company? Because you love, because you love to worship? Because you love the accountability that you have in a place and where others can join together with you. You know, there's a pivotal point in the buying and selling of a house. Those of you who've done this, I'm sure you know this quite well. You come to that pivotal crossroads that we call the inspection, right? The inspection. The inspection can be a day of dread for the seller because the seller knows that a team of inspectors are going to come through there and they are going to make a note of every single imperfection. And all of that information will be presented to the buyer. And ultimately at that time the buyer will then have the opportunity to, to say, well, I think you need to fix this or you need to change this or, or maybe just walk away from the deal all together. You see, the outside of the house, it can look perfect. It can have that great curb appeal. Can not. Whenever that team of inspectors goes through, it becomes obvious that the inside, there's a lot of work to be done. This is the exact imagery I believe that the Apostle Paul is utilizing. He's saying that there's a day that's coming that your spiritual house, your spiritual temple, it, it will be inspected. The way that you are building your life whether you're building with gold, silver, or precious stone, that will be shown. If you're building with wood, hay, and straw, that will be shown. And you can conceal that from just about everybody. You can conceal that from me, your pastor. You can conceal that from your friends here in the church. You can conceal that from just about everybody. But friend, let me ask you this question, can you conceal this from the eye of God? And the answer is no. So stop building with sticks and straw. 
been filled with the precious things. And I know up until this point, maybe you've hated this sermon. <coughs> I don't even like this sermon that much. But let me give you the great news. And the great news is that God, in His supreme love, has provided everything that you need to build with. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him, who called us by His own glory and goodness. He's provided everything that we need. We just need to recognize and realize that we need Him. That pride and arrogance will only buy us straw and sticks. But it is in humility. It is in repentance. It is in the disciplined life of a Christian that we find ourselves investing in gold and silver. Invest in these things, my friend. Invest in these things. And in that day, as you stand before your Lord and Savior Jesus, at his elevated seat, he will look down upon you and say, you built well upon the foundation for which I lay. Let him look upon you and say, oh, faithful servant, well done. Come and enjoy my inheritance. Will you pray with me? Lord, we come before you now. We thank you for this day that you have given to us. And Lord, we thank you for texts like this. Although these are difficult texts, although they are...